the opportunity to introduce the Emoja Equity Institute. This week, we celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Despite yesterday's historic inauguration, which focused on hope and healing, the insurrection of January 6 hasn't been far from our minds, just as the reckoning of racial justice hasn't been far from our minds. Last year, we turned our focus to dismantling white supremacy and racial injustice through a variety of important initiatives. Last summer, our Emoja program faculty and staff presented a proposal to, to develop an Emoja Equity Institute. I know that many of you had the opportunity to hear about the proposal throughout fall semester. Today, I am pleased to announce the launch of the Emoja Equity Institute, UEI is what we're referring to it as. And I'm gonna read just briefly from the proposal. The Emoja Equity Institute will establish COM as a research and training hub for the development of innovative anti-racist programs and services. The UEI seeks to complement the mission, strategic plan and equity plan of the College of Bryn the president's nine point plan and the chancellor's office call to action to community colleges. Uh, today's panel presentation is the first of many UEI programs to come. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the faculty, staff and administrators who are involved in the UEI. And at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Walter Turner, our Moja coordinator to introduce our panel. Walter, good morning. Thank you and uh, glad to uh, be here is certainly my uh, uh, my pleasure, and they're asking me to start here my video, which I've started my uh, video. Um, I want to thank you. Such good news there, uh, uh, Dr. Kuhn, regarding the uh, funds for curricula. Uh, that's certainly one of the key pillars of what we'll be doing with the Emoja uh, Equity Institute. And excuse me, I had a different screen backing on because I was doing something the other day, but I'll, I'll leave it up. I'm at my vacation home, so we'll, we'll work from that. I want to thank, first of all, uh, President Superintendent Dr. David Wayne Kuhn, Vice President John Eldridge, and uh, Dean Greg Nelson uh, for their support of the Emoja Equity Institute. I want to also thank um, the Board of Trustees of College of Marin for being in attendance. I know we'll have a session with them coming up in a week or so. Uh, my name is Professor Walter Turner. I'm the chairperson of the social sciences uh, department. I'm the coordinator of the College of Marin and Moja program. Uh, today we'll be hearing from Trap to Vote in this main session. And then there'll be some breakout sessions after this. We'll go from 11 to 12. And then there's going to be a Friday session actually where we'll have some uh, reflections on the work ahead regarding equity and inclusion uh, at the College of Marin. I especially want to take a moment here uh, to extend a big round of thanks to all of the faculty and staff at the College of Marin. Somewhere in September or October, our team working on the Emoja Equity Institute uh, went through and began a series of what we refer to as engagement meetings. And I have to say that uh, they're very enlightening. Uh, they're very exciting. Uh, we did a lot of learning, we did a lot of listening, and I'm convinced that the College of Marin is, I'm more positive that the College of Marin is on the road to building institutional equity at the College of Marin. We undertook approximately 25, what we refer to as engagement meetings, and I want to thank all of the faculty and all of the governance and all the committee members who participated in those particular conversations. I wanna give you a credit here online. Uh, we met with the learning committees, with MAPS, with Puente, with ASCOM, uh, with the Academic Senate, with the uh, Classified Senate, with the department chairs, with psychological services, with counseling, with the IDEA Committee, with the GRIT Committee, with professional learning, with the Transfer Center, with the Internship and Careers, with CSEA, with UPM, with EOPS, with the athletic department, with Summer Bridge, with Compass, with Outreach, with the Marin City community leaders, with Trap to Vote, who you'll hear from in just a few moments, with the Educational Planning Committee, with the Administrative Cabinet, with Distance Education, with Deans, with PRAC, with the SEIU, and I think that totals about 30 different meetings that our team has conducted since September and early October. And I think we have one or two more uh, left to complete. 
So to share with you, and I'm running a timer here so I don't take up too much time, uh, to share with you what the purpose of the engagement meetings has been, uh, has been the following. First of all, to hear from our colleagues about the ongoing equity work which has been going on here at College of Marin. And there has been some fantastic work. The UEI is dedicated to making College of Marin institutional, to bring all this work into an institutional framework. So we've heard from uh, the, the work that's being done by people such as MAPS and Puente and the Academic Senate and EOPS, Professional Learning Committee and UPM and USC. So much great work is being done. So we wanted to hear that. We wanted to be able to listen to that work. Second of all, coming out of these engagement meetings, um, having discussions about the best way to build institutional equity. And when we say institutional equity at community college, we're talking not only about the staff, we're also talking about the students, and we're also talking about our communities. Third of all, we wanted to make sure that we were in line with the Chancellor's Call to Action, which came in June of 2020, the Strategic Master Plan, and most importantly, um, President uh, Dr. David Waynes Kuhn, his nine-point plan, uh, which he issued somewhere in, I believe it was probably of uh, August of uh, last year, August of 2020. And, and looking at that uh, particular plan and quoting President Kuhn, higher education, quoting, is a system rooted in racism and white supremacy. It is important to practice transparency by naming this and acknowledging College of Marin's areas of growth and how we are transforming this system. If you have not seen President Kuhn's nine point statements on um, his call after the chancellor's call, you should take a look at it. It's quite revealing and it's one thing that we want the Emoji Equity Institute to be on track with. Finally, in this proposal, we wanted to make sure that we centered our work around issues of accessibility, of anti-racism, of inclusion, of giving us the opportunity to dream and build and take advantage of this moment in history. And you've heard that from all of our speakers this morning. You'll continue to hear that from Trap to Vote. Uh, there's a scene in a film from the civil rights movement in 1963 and 1964. And uh, one of the participants in the strikes in Selma and other places comes online and they say, you know, you can't dream about things that you can't even imagine. And what we're saying is we want to use our imagination and change the way our institution uh, looks. Martin Luther King in 1967 uh, made a speech that uh, for all the praise that we give to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, he made a speech that uh, didn't make him the most popular person in the world. And that was his speech that he gave at the Riverside Church in 1967. Uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to listen to it, uh, take a listen to it. Uh, why I oppose the war in Vietnam is giving at the Riverside Church. Quoting the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and this is most appropriate at this moment. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. We, we're at a listening moment here, uh, uh, my colleagues. Many of you know I've, I've taught here, I've been on campus in many activities. We are not going to address uh, decades of systemic racism, of othering, of exclusion, of the way in which people who are immigrants have been treated, uh, the way in which LBGT communities have been attacked. We're not going to address that with one committee. We're not going to address that with one change in the governance system. We're only going to be able to address this and be successful if our institution is on board about making these changes. This is not just a task for the Emoja Equity Institute. This is a task for all of College of Marin. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be uh, so honored uh, that uh, President Kuhn uh, has announced 
the official launching of the Emoja Equity Institute. It gives me great pleasure. Our panel today is composed of a number of people uh, who've been very, very active uh, in Marin County over the last year, and many of them going back uh, much before that. Um, they refer to themselves as trapped to vote. Uh, they were very active in the voting campaigns over the last several months before the November elections. But even prior to that, they were engaged in the Bay Area community, all the way from Sacramento, all the way down to the areas of, of Santa Cruz. I want to announce first uh, uh, Mr. Barry Achias. He is a consultant on issues related to social justice, equity, and education. Uh, he is a founding member of several organizations, Voice of the Youth, uh, Black Blueprints, Hidden Gems, et cetera. He works from Sacramento. He was formerly a student at College of Marin, so we welcome Barry back to College of Marin. I want to introduce uh, Miss Amber Allen Pearson. Uh, she's an empath, she's a mother, she's a poet. Uh, she is a proud graduate of College of Marin. Uh, she was formerly the current, uh, the wellness outreach specialist at TAM High. She's currently working in issues of health. Welcome to College of Marin today, Amber. I want to introduce Paul Austin. He's the founder and CEO of Play Marin, uh, which serves approximately 300 young people all across uh, Marin County. He is a uh, graduate, I believe, of Dominican University. Uh, he's the one person we have here who I don't think he attended College of Marin, uh, but he did you attend College of Marin? Okay, he did attend College of Marin. So we got five for five uh, here. I know his family has been active here at College of Marin. Bishlam Bullock, who is along with his wife, Amy, is the owners of Salon B in downtown San Rafael for over 10 years. He is from one of the original families that came to Marin City in the early 1940s. And in contrast to the story about the great migration, uh, which is talked about a lot, people who came to Marin City and Vallejo and Oakland and came from Louisiana and Mississippi and Texas, they didn't come just because they decided to migrate for jobs. They came because they were escaping the horrors and terrors of the South. And those are things that as we can see over the last few years, last few decades continue to be uh, prominent in our American culture. And finally, Alina Maunder, uh, who is the newly elected governing board member of the Saucelio Marin City School District. She is a lifelong uh, resident of Marin City, her family, the early people in Marin City. Uh, she is currently the uh, lead nurse at the Zuckenberg San Francisco General Hospital. She is the nurse manager, and she also has a program in Marin City, an after school program, uh, which helps with tutoring and assistance. And by way of full disclosure, uh, I have known uh, Bisham for a while. I've known Amber for a while. I've known Paul for a while. I've known Alina for a while. And I knew Barry. Barry was also in my classes when he was in attendance at uh, College of Marin. So for the next uh, 40 minutes to 45 minutes, uh, we're going to have some question and dialogue. Um, you will have an opportunity to talk with each of them in some of the breakout sessions. Uh, they're coming up between 11 and 12. Um, and you'll be able to talk with them directly. And there's three breakout sessions. I believe uh, Beth or one of our other uh, staff people will come on, faculty people will come on and tell you how to link to those particular uh, discussions. So thank you for being here today. Uh, we're very, very honored that you could make the time and that you could be one stage of continuing uh, what our president, what our campus and uh, others have been looking at. Let, let's start off and let's talk a bit and you can unmute yourselves. Uh, let's start off here and give us some background of what Trap the Vote is, what Trap the Vote has been and how it's uh, grown. I think we're turning to Barry and, and Paul. So go right ahead. You have the floor. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. How y'all doing? Okay, thank you. Um, it's Barry Axius. Um, I'm one of the uh, founders of the Trap the Vote Sacramento, which we started in uh, 2018. Our primary goal was to increase the number of voters amongst black youth and young adults um, to kind of break away from the um, stigma uh, that vote black folks have in voting. 
uh, the way we kind of collaborated, uh, me and Paul first, as well as in connecting with Amber and Bishlam. Um, 2008, I kind of saw, um, I believe during the midterms that um, there was a real need for us to kind of um, cultivate the ideas and the voices of young um, black uh, people in our communities. I really saw a, a, a change and a turn in 2014 when I really understood how powerful local voting was. So Trap the Vote really came from this idea of local voting, state voting. Um, me and Paul, just at that particular time, were just um, swapping ideas and t-shirts as I kind of galvanized certain things um, in Sacramento. Then um, talked to Paul as we kind of looked at a deeper lens on what this could actually be. Um, looking at the Trumpism that came about um, in 2016, we looked at 2020, really launching it to the next level where then Amber and um, Bishlam came together because we saw the power in our vote. We saw that um, our vote at, at, at many times was suppressed and how do we stop oppression of our vote is by galvanizing, making it hip, Grieving in a great experience and, and gravitating our young people to showing how their vote um, can be powerful. And I think we line that up by the protest in the summer of 2020, as I like to call it the righteous uprising. We utilized that moment and showed how can we produce power from protest? How can we utilize sustainable, equitable things that create change? And that's how we really um, elevated our Trap the Vote um, 2020. It was a great experience. We went from education with panels like this due to um, social distancing and COVID-19, as well as being able to still have two powerful block parties where we not only um, created um, voting uh, aptitudes, but also we leveled up the playing field by creating um, black markets for businesses to cultivate entrepreneurship. So it was a power of building and power of voting. So outside of Trap the Vote, we created Vote and Build, where not only are we going to vote, that's one part of the phrase, but we're also gonna be building at the same particular time. Okay. I wanna let you know uh, that we, I clearly, I should thank uh, Professor Crawford for editing down there uh, bios. Had I read each of their full bios, we would have run out of time. Uh, so you really have a dynamic group in, in front of you. We want to keep it moving and we'll bounce around a little bit with the, uh, with the questions, but we wanted to make sure that you could leave this session with thoughts for the upcoming breakout session. Speak on your experiences organizing throughout Marin County over the last uh, eight to 10 months on the issues of equity and anti-racism and in voting you've highlighted to some degree, meaning that I think you, there was a lot of work that you did in Tiburon and that was very well publicized. You were visible in Nevada, you were visible in Sacramento. So talk a bit about that work, what those experiences were like uh, raising the issues of equity and anti-racism. Sure. Good morning. Before I get started, I just want to say how glad I am to be here, particularly with some of my favorite professors um, that are in the building, Jessica Park. I don't know if Dr. Tipton is still here or Paul Cheney, Pat Sirianni, and of course, Bonnie Bornstein and Walter Turner. Thank you for having us. I'm so excited. Um, in terms of the last 10 months, as Barry said, the way we came together gave us power. We are aligned and have very similar values, which allowed us to do the emotional labor with each other that it takes to walk into a space that can sometimes feel hostile just because you're so othered as people of color. The homogeny of Marin makes it hard sometimes to go into Tiburon or Nevada and speak these pains that we're experiencing from watching what's happening over the, the country. Um, but we, I was especially um, pleasantly surprised in some of those spaces about the support that came from the community, Tiburon particularly. We were able to not only organize in a way that supported a local black business that had been harassed and create a cash mob, but we also were able to get rid of two um, officers in the Tiburon um, Police Department that had no business being there. Behavior and their uh, 
their show of racism towards black people in the community. Um, Novato, we were able to support some young people who had been harmed by a group of white Trump supporters who had actually been violent with them and made threats towards them. So some of the places, uh, Marin City on June 2nd, which is actually where we start, first started working together, we had over 1500 people come to um, protest and also grieve over the murder of George Floyd. But some places we had a bit more resistant, resistance, like here in Mill Valley, where I live and where I'm a part of the DEI task force, we have been challenged with the mayor who has shown a lot of racism. And though there were people who came out and supported, we also found uh, people who showed up uh, hostile. And we also have found a lot of resistance to some of the things that we've suggested and asked for in terms of creating equity. So it's a mixed bag in terms of the response. Like I said, there's a place where I'm pleasantly surprised by the people that have shown up, but there has also been a huge resistance, which makes sense because why would, why we have to, why do white people want to change what is? Why would they want to? It's comfortable. Marin is very, um, is a bubble. There's not, we're not seeing a lot of police shootings here and some of the things that we're seeing in some of the more extreme places. It makes it really easy to ignore or to deny or to act as if this is a place where racism or diversity training doesn't exist. But it's because of the lack of diversity that this is a place that needs it the most. What are some of these, these challenges? I, I know when I, I got a text from you, Amber, saying that, in fact, that there is a diversity equity committee. I think Novato had one a while back, uh, but there's one in Fairfax. Uh, Marin County has one at this point. Mill Valley, you've given some, some discussion on that. Tip Ron is considering one. San Rafael is considering them. But at the same time, I saw the article in the Pacific Sun the other day that said, despite this activity that some things haven't changed at all. What, how do movements of social change and consciousness, how do you avoid these uh, pitfalls? What are the, the challenges of building alliances in these communities beyond what you've talked about very specifically? Um, go ahead, Paul. Real quick. <clears throat> um, I mean, well, some of the challenges is that sometimes the message might get mixed up. It might go into a whole different direction. Right, we got to make sure that we keep um, keep our message really plain and clear, which is to support the Black community and to support Black people, especially here in Marin. Like we cannot get away from that message because if we do, then it just starts to avoid and just creates um, just a whole different uh, fa facade, let's say, of what the true message is, which is right now the support of Black people and the Black agenda. So we got to make sure that we stay on point and make sure that everybody supports the black agenda now. Because sometimes that just, you know, people will try and divert you from what the true, um, what our true plan is. Like it, it is to support black people 100% to make sure that we get policy change, to make sure that systems are changed. And we just can't turn a blind eye to that. We cannot no longer like, we gotta hold people accountable for some of the choices that's being made um, that's keeping black communities in the same position that they are in. You know, we need to have economic change, but a lot of that um, starts, it, it all pretty much starts within the systems, the different systems, the education system, the police system, right here in Moran is, uh, is dealing with the, uh, the board of supervisors and a lot of the decisions that they make on behalf of the black and brown communities um, that would negatively impact, um, impact them. So, you know, for me, it's everybody standing collectively together to make sure that we don't get away from the Black agenda because the Black agenda has never had its place um, in America. And so now, to, today, now is an opportunity for us to continue to push that forward. Mm -hmm. before, yeah. I go to the, before I go to the next question, and I'll come right back to you, uh, Bishlam. Paul, give us just a, a, a short sketch here of what, uh, uh, play Moran is because I, I see you it's so busy and so it seems to be so effective does it include all of Marin County how does it work give us a few sentences here well so so play Moran is all about creating more diversity through play and activity and one of the main things that I look at is closing the activity gap my focus is Marin City to make sure that the youth in Marin City have what they need so currently when we look at 
so previously, when you look at the activity gap, so after school, um, I worked in like public schools and I worked in private schools and I saw how the affluent families here in Marin had a wonderful schedule for their kids after school. They had tutoring, they had band, they had sports, they had chess club. But when we look right here in Marin City, they did not have those same opportunities. A lot of times you had to leave Marin City in order to participate in uh, extracurricular activities. But no, we bring that right here home in order for kids to make sure that they have what they need. So with Play Marin, we do everything. So we do the basic sports, basketball, um, track and field, girls volleyball, which was never done previously, starting a lacrosse program, but do a lot of outdoor activities too, getting kids out surfing and kayaking, mountain biking, um, to be able to open up, you know, what's their possibilities. Um, but part of it is, is trying to hold people accountable. Why Marin City don't have a, a ball field that's playable? The ball field has been ran down for over 15 years or so, and kids can't even play on it. We only have two opportunities for recreational um, activities here. We have a gym that's over 70 years old. Everywhere else in Marin, they have new facilities. I don't understand why Marin City don't. And then we have a park, Rocky Ground Park. We love it to death. But at the same time, we just don't have the same opportunities, nor do we have the same facilities as the rest of Marin. We don't have a grocery store, which is a whole nother topic. So you look at the health disparity, but Marin County can do something about it, right? Like in everywhere else, West Marin, they have a beautiful gym. I'm glad that they do. But we're such a tight pocket here in Marin City that things need to be developed to be on par with the rest of the kids in Mill Valley or Tipperon. Um, okay. okay. Bishop, you wanted to follow up on that previous a question which I was asking there about some of the uh, challenges and I'll get another question out there, but you wanted to follow up, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just want to throw quickly in there what I'm discovering for myself, just because I'm kind of a, me and my wife and the team here, uh, we're used to uh, taking an issue, grabbing it and running with it quickly without a lot of red tape. And what I find in Marin County in particular is one of the main obstacles is that we have these new DEI task force and all this, but a lot of it is just a lot of rhetorical red tape, people t talking amongst one another in these meetings and, and patting themselves on the back. Um, uh, what I find is that it, that is a hindrance to getting things done. Paul has organiza organization that's ready to go. Uh, Barry has organizations that are ready to go. Amber has programs and things in her mind that are ready to go. And we need direct funding and we need people to step out of the way and let people get to work and finish up what they need to get, you know, get done. We, we know how to run these things. Um, and we feel like, I feel like some of the DEI stuff is a lot of red tape and a lot of wasted time. So that's my, I think that's one of the main obstacles. And I want people to get really clear that we have things ready to go. Most of these community, most of our communities do. We, we need funding and we need direct action uh, uh, with the overall Marin County community as well as College of Marin to kind of get that stuff going uh, directly to the people so we can get working. Okay, Bishlam, thank you so much. I do want to thank you, Bishlam. When I grew up in Marin City, your, uh, your, uh, your grandfather, uh, he was a minister, he was a prominent minister. And I always appreciate the fact that when he stopped me, he never talked to me about the church or about religion. He right. always was inquiring how I was doing. So he always sticks in my mind as somebody who was really one of the pillars of our, our community. Let, let me get a question out here in terms of, and maybe we can get a little bit of a round table going here. I wanna to get to uh, Alina Mader, who was uh, a student here at College of Marin. Her counselor, in fact, was uh, Professor uh, Renetta Early. Uh, and I remember when Alina was here. Two questions out here. Uh, how do you define equity? How do we move from the words that have become common multiculturalism and diversity to agency and inclusion, meaning from the words to action in some way, shape or form. Agency means giving power, inclusion means being part of the process. Um, and how do we, uh, and you were College of Marin students, all of you, um, <laughs> you know, re reflect on uh, the role of an institution like the College of Marin. And another one while I have you on here, uh, uh, Alina, you work directly in education. So why don't you go to that one first 
And then we'll come back to the one about defining equity and about uh, moving from to agency and inclusion. But talk to us about your perspective on education, see where we can link that, Alina. Sure. Um, so I have uh, two school age children, a fifth grader and a first grader. Um, and uh, being a lifelong resident of Marin City, you know, I grew up um, understanding um, the challenges that uh, children face that live in Marin City, that we're a divided community between Marin City and Sausalito, but yet we are Sausalito Marin City School District. There's a, a, um, a, di a division um, that is very, you know, blatant. Um, mm -hmm. And that we need to, there needs to be some, some changes. But it's not just in the community of Marin City, it's in the county of Marin. There's some changes that need to happen so that we can um, start to actually uh, make a change with uh, the systemic racism that exists in our educational system here. Um, and so that being said, a couple of years ago, um, I decided that I wanted to take action, that I wanted to be a part of the change that needs to happen. Um, and so I started to attend school board meetings. I started to really get involved um, with both schools. So with both um, Martin Luther King uh, Bayside, as well as Willow Creek Academy, which are the two schools that are uh, within the district in Marin City and Sausalito. Um, I actually first sat on the Willow Creek board. Um, and during that first year, um, you know, we were, we were challenged as a district. Um, we were mandated by the attorney, the state attorney general to um, desegregate uh, Martin Luther King School, which was, which is still predominantly um, comprised of black and brown children. And so, um, you know, I decided that I needed to do more, um, more than just sit on Willow Creek board um, I, while I was able to learn that our children at, at both schools were uh, failing were in, the, in the bottom 10%. Um, and I, when I say our kids, I'm meaning the black and brown kids were failing and that they, um, the support systems that were set um, were not making an impact. They were not, you know, our, our children just, you know, wasn't, aren't learning. They're just not learning. And so I decided I wanted to run for the Sausalito Marin City School Board last year. Um, and part of my message was, we need to make some, some, some changes. We need to um, improve our classrooms, um, meaning we need to be able to provide equitable classrooms. We need to start early. We need to start um, making sure that our children know that they are valued, not just at um, not just when they're in eighth grade or seventh grade, but this needs to start before they even get to kindergarten. This needs to start at an early age, pre-K. And so I wanted to make sure that I was involved in the, the policy development. I wanted to make sure that I was involved in the decision-making behind educating our children um, and moving past um, the, um, the, the whole image that our children can't learn, that our children um, aren't worthy of learning, um, that our children should not be challenged. Um, and that, you know, what, you know, the, the premise has been, you know, black children can't learn, you know, and they deserve to be in the 10%, you know, um, or that they, um, they shouldn't really, um, uh, strive for better, you know? And so I wanted to be a part of that conversation. Um, I wanted to be a part, a part of the action of making the changes that we need to make within our educational systems. Um, and I wanna make sure that our children are just supported. Thank you, thank you, Alina. We've had the opportunity, the Emoji Equity Institute in our planning as one of our engagement uh, meetings uh, to meet with Trap to Vote. They've given graciously of their time on maybe three occasions and they take phone calls and they take uh, texts. Uh, so we really have an opportunity to emoji equity. Let me get these two questions out here and 
do a bit of a round, a round table and people can jump in and we'll get back to a couple of other focus uh, pre-questions, which I've, I've given to you. One point, which I think was uh, that there are many diverse communities, but let's do these two first, meaning that defining equity, just give us a definition of, of equity, how you see it. Um, and we'll move it around the horn and we'll get some people and some people won't. And then second of all, when we asked you, when the Emoji Equity Institute asked you to come to College of Marin to speak, why did you accept? You could have said, you know, uh, we don't know if it's any value of our time. Why did you accept the invitation? So those two, two questions, I'll go first to uh, uh, Barry. No, 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 no. I want to pass it to Amber first. Let me let, pass let, it to let, Amber first. Amber, because I think she wants to also add into something. So roll it out, Am. Thank you, Barry. Um, I appreciate you. I think that actually what I was going to add to the earlier question can fit into my answer, which is that my late father, Kerry Pearson, one of my favorite quotes from him is that we have to acknowledge here in Marin and in this country that racism is not accidental. Mm. It was socially engineered. Mm. And um, first things first is that we have to acknowledge that. And the work that has to go into anti-racism means that we it has to be deliberate, it has to be radical, and it has to be looked at from a engineering perspective, from a social engineering perspective. And that goes back to the other question about some of the challenges we have in Marin. Um, homogeny is a problem. I you know, the context of my thinking around these issues is that racism is a disease. It should be classified along with narcissism, sociopathy, the denial for white people to sit in front of what is happening to black people, brown people, native people in this country and act like everything is an accident and like it's okay is an absolute disease. It is an uh -huh. It can be very good, well-intended people who can sit there and be observant of this without being able to know what to do. Because how do white people inform anti-racism when they are their neighbor to the left and their neighbor to the right looks just like them and lives just like them? Without diversity, it is hard to create the change that's necessary. And when we're such a small percentage, which for Black people were less than 3% in this county, there is so much pressure on us to exist in all of the oppressive systems that have been designed to cause harm to us that it becomes hard to survive it while teaching white people, while being activists. Um, so anti-racism in this county is gonna be look very different. It's gonna need some outside support. It's gonna need um, a lot of reflection and it's gonna honestly need some impersonal things which I'll speak to later. But um, if racism is, is a disease, Marin County is one of the most infested places, Ooh. definitely is in California based on the race count study, which is a study that was done um, out of Southern California on all, it was a non-biased study of the disparities in the different counties in California. And Marin got number one. We are the most despaired uh, county. We are, which basically, According to my father, and, and I agree, it, it means we're the most racist county. So we, we are the biggest problem, but I always look at it as that also means we are the opportunity for the biggest solutions. Yes. And Absolutely. why did I accept um, the invitation? One, Walter, it's because of you, because I highly esteem you. I learned so much in your class. And um, the other reason is because not only did College of Marin serve me, but education in general, whether fair or not, is the gateway to a better future. And College of Marin is really well placed because you're the gateway to higher education. You're the gateway to uh, the advancement of the individual and therefore the community. So there's so much opportunity here in terms of the radical change that I am speaking to. Woo okay. Are there, are there other, are there yeah. other people who want to speak on that same question? Yeah. I don't know if the I don't know if the interpreter could interpret that woo -hoo. I well, guess they can. All that. <laughs> so they can do that. Is there somebody else? That, did you want to weigh in on either of the points yeah, I raised me, about me, defining let equity? Let me slide right in ahead. real quick. I know I know Amber. I, that that's a lot of heat. So I'm gonna kind of keep it brief. Laid it out. Um, <laughs> yesterday. 
was a monumental moment, right? Um, after 12 years pr prior to having a the first black um, president or the first president of color, so to speak, you now had a black woman um, being the first woman, first VP. We, when we talk about equity and equality, these things are symbolic. For some folks who will chew that up, they will say that's the equity, that's the equality, it's working. For a person like myself and my team, we're saying that's another symbolic gesture of progress that really is not dictating progress, but pandering to our emotions by saying this key phrase, first black. In 2021, when we're still celebrating being the first black anything, that's a problem. That does not balance when we talk about equity that does not deliver equality because these things that happen so often that we're given symbolically usually looks like more of individual assets and that's not for the collective. So when we have dialed in in these conversations, the reason why I was so excited about being a part of this, one of my um, to-do list things was to always come back to Marin because I felt the pain of being an African-American, not knowing who I was. Because not only do I identify as a black male, but I'm also Haitian. So that dynamic was delivering me from having to say, well, I'm Haitian, I'm not necessarily African-American, but African-American saying, you're not really black, you Haitian. And then white people looking at me like, you're black. So that whole self-division within our own culture created this idea that I didn't really have a place. So as I've felt so out of place and displaced, I've now found myself to be able to say, I'm a black man who is Haitian. And I've found that energy and I found that source of purpose. When I remembered what I grew up in, in Marin County, I said, there is no way that when I get to the levels of where my voice will be heard, I would not come back to this county that has given me so much love, but has given me so much hate at the same particular time. So it was an honor, not only to connect with my brothers and sisters as Trap the Vote, but an honor to say, finally, one of those plateaus that I reached for to be able to talk about the lack there of equity, the lack there of diversity, this idea that multiculturalism includes black when it really does say it discludes black. I was going to be um, the first one in line to say, now I'm going to use my voice of power, my experiences of pain, not, of, not as anger, but as solution basis for us to move into what I believe is what we want to circle around is humanity. I want someone just to look at a black face as a human, not just as a black face and judge me by my character, not by my skin tone. Word, word. Word. Yeah. Does somebody else want to add, does somebody else want to add on that? You know, Bishlam, as we're going forward, when we had the conversations with you, you raised the fact that you went to Marin for a period of time and then you stopped going to Marin. You became involved very much in the in the business community. And so you, you raised some points the last time we had a conversation about what College of Marin might be able to offer to people like yourselves who had those type of interests because you've had a thriving business. You're from the Marin City community. You do a number of things to support uh, efforts in Marin City. In fact, I know that you've supported uh, the foundation here at College of Marin. Y your, your thoughts, I, I want to leave our, our staff and our faculty with some, these are things we can do. These are things we can dream about. Great, great. Uh, yeah, I'd love to tap in on that. I mean, College of Marin, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll say uh, it was great to attend your classes. I was surprised that it was such a robust class that you had there. So that was always surprising to me, uh, and which again, shouldn't have been surprising. And there was some support stuff there, there, but it was not, not in a way that, uh, that I could use. Um, uh, I, I think the College of Marin, 
as a business person in College of Marin, I think the College of Marin uh, has a great opportunity here to become aware, A, of who the Black business owners are in Marin County and connect with them and therefore connect their students with them, uh, especially the ones that are more in the entrepreneurial spirit. It may not be as, uh, you know, connected to the, the academic versions of what College of Marin is offering. Um, I think that College of Marin has a great opportunity to create entrepreneurship uh, workshops, courses, classes, speakers that can come in such as myself um, and guide students that are coming directly out of Marin City um, into uh, running and owning businesses they don't, that don't necessarily have to do with uh, academic achievement. Um, I think that that's a really easy way for College of Marin to flex their uh, financial equity muscles as well as uh, their academic muscles, which they have access to. We know you guys have access. Um, so that would be something really easy to do through the Emotia Pro, uh, project. We could uh, create bridges uh, for students to get directly into business. As we all know, um, college is not necessarily on the academic side, the direct link for people to uh, achieve success financially or in the community. Um, sometimes they just need to understand what they're great at, focus on that. Uh, get some equity, some finance, and, and get straight to work so that they can do what I'm doing, which is, you know, in a position where I can go directly back to the community because I have time, because I, I am successful in my business, and I, I have room to go out and speak and, uh, and participate. So I, I encourage College of Marin to step up their, uh, their game when it comes to interacting with uh, Black people within business and entrepreneurship uh, in, in Marin County. We want to be able to live, work, own, uh, operate, and be visible in Marin. We don't want to have to hop somewhere else to, to, to succeed and do what we, we, we grew up here. We earned our spot here. Our, our grandparents uh, uh, made it so that we could exist here uh, through, through lots of trials and tribulations. Uh, so we, we, are, we are demanding that College of Marin recognize that. We're demanding that you come into our community and um, and understand that uh, you can help us in, in a myriad of ways, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship and, and, uh, and access to business equity. So that's what I'd have to say about that. You go ahead, Paul. Real quick, Walter. So there, there are some things that we've discussed that we want College of Rand to be able to do, some action, some action items, as we call them. Um, curriculum, dive into your curriculum, change it. Um, have more activism and civil rights. So women gender studies, um, look at racism as a disease. Mm. That discussion, bring right. in some black literature. Absolutely. You know, having more guest speakers, like Bishlam says. Uh, let's figure out a way to get more black teachers, not just on College of Marin campus, but maybe y'all can influence um, some black teachers to come to Marin in general. Um, open up your campus to, 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 to black and brown organizations to make sure that we get more black faces on that campus, all of your facilities, everything from y'all state of art um, aquatic center. Um, all the way down to your classrooms, you know, so so black people can see their self in a college campus early in life. Um, create relationships with like Bayside, MLK, Willow Creek, and other schools that serve black kids to make sure that there's a connection. Um, one thing that we do know is that our educational system here in Marin City it needs a little joke. So if we get some professors to help coach some of those teachers then that could be a huge benefit. Um, all, so I'm, I'm on this new thing, looking for a research. I'm looking for somebody to do a case study. Absolutely. So reach out to UC Berkeley and some of your other partners to come and do a case study, especially as it deals with Marin City and the, West, the rest of Marin County. Um, so we can look at damages, right? Mm -hmm. Because we do know that, you know, Marin City was established in the 1940s. But due to redlining, black people wasn't able to buy land outside of Marin City. <laughs> right? and so when you look at that, you know, if we had the same opportunities where our grandparents, if they if they had the opportunity to go and buy land in Tipperon and other areas in Marin, it would have created generational wealth. So you can directly um, look at certain families and look at the progress because you could date it back. So it would be wonderful to get somebody to come to get a, um, a university or College of Marin themselves to come in and do a case study um, and look at Marin City and its uh, totality and why it hasn't improved over the years like the rest of Marin has. Um, okay. We talk about 
free education. Free education mm. for black, black and brown students right here. Marin County has enough money, we could raise it. Talk to them. Um, housing for black students. I know that's one thing that I look at is how do we how do we create housing for kids to really get um, a little bit of a college experience? Being able to leave your home and because right now some kids just go to Santa Rosa just so they could leave the house and have a place to stay. So yep. college brand has figured out a way to create um, housing um, for students, um, in particular black and brown students to to come and live on campus. That'd be awesome. And then we talked about uh, infinity spaces. Or affinity spaces, um, black wellness, workshops, tutorial, relaxing and organizing opportunities for people on campus just to feel like College of Moran is a place for them. So those are a few things that we discuss and you know, we would love to see College of Moran take some steps. Um, another one that I have to a moderator because I'm running out of time here and I can see that I have uh, about another 10 minutes. I have like another uh, 20 minutes worth of questions and they probably have another 50 or 60 minutes worth of, of answers. Uh, Why don't you go, uh, did, were you on mic, Amber? Or let me let me throw a couple of things out there to see where we can we can get. One I, I need to get out there is one of the pre-questions I sent you. And there was something you said to me, Amber, that has not left me since you said it. Um, and I'll say that after I say the question. The first thing was that, you know, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and many of the others, some of their greatest support, some of their greatest magnetism came from the way in which brown and poor communities and immigrant communities uh, work with them and attach with them. So you've been doing that in Marin. I'm interested in the ways in which you build alliances with uh, Latinx communities, you build alliances with immigrant communities, you build alliances with people who were poor by class. I'm also interested in that. And, and Amber, the thing you said that stuck with me, I hope I can get back to Alina before we finish this. You were talking to me about, uh, talking to our group, not just to me, about the trauma. And you said, even after you come out and lobby around issues around equity and you go to the task force, then you stopped and you said, and then you have to go home. So yeah. let me, Pull those two things out there and let's see what we can get with that. Yeah, it's emotional labor. Like I spoke to it a little bit earlier. It's not easy being black and it's not easy being black in Marin, but it's not easy being black in general. We're, you know, when I see these men being killed by the police officers, I think of my son or I think of the brothers on this panel. I think of so many men that I love, you know, as a woman, how often I feel unsafe to be expressive in certain spaces because of all of the ways that we're told that our emotions are uh, too extreme. There are so many ways that at the end of the day, I give all of this. I go and I make these alliances and I still go home to my blackness. We still go home. In a lot of ways, that's what's great about this group. These brothers hold me down and I hope I do the same for them. But, you know, it, in, for example, the time that I worked at TAM, well-intended white people, but the environment felt hostile to me because people couldn't see me or couldn't relate. That denial as a disease meant that my experience in a very, very passive conversation could sometimes feel like a, tiny, a thousand tiny cuts. And I had to go home with that and I still had to earn money. So I still had to show up and I had to be graceful and I had to be polite and I had to not rock the boat. We, as Black people, take the burden of white comfort by not discussing these issues that we have to exist in, that we have to walk in and live in every day. And so right now, the challenge being what it takes to walk and chew gum, what it takes to exist in those systems, to be a regular human being, like Barry said, who's trying to be happy and have joy and have love in your life and pay your bills and eat good food and maybe lose a couple of pounds, whatever your issues, whatever you're personally going through in your body and still give it to the world to point out all of these things are wrong. All of these things are dangerous and all of these things are a threat to me and my people. Okay, okay, let's keep moving. That question I asked about diverse communities and Alina said something when we met about we have to start a lot earlier. If we could get some bounce around on those two, I would feel like I'd uh, uh, done my job today and the Emoji Equity Institute people would say something positive to me when this is over. 
<laughs> yes. Um, uh, I just wanted just to say that we do have to start earlier. We have to start with um, the pre-K. We have to start with um, getting to know every child and celebrating their uniqueness, celebrating what they bring to the table, um, you know, making sure that we acknowledge challenges that may exist, challenges that are, um, that might come from their home life, that might, you know, come from, you know, what they're facing outside of school. Um, but we have to uh, recognize um, their culture, their languages that are spoken. Um, and we have to start that at an early age to make sure that uh, we are embracing all of them. Um, uh, adding into that, when we talk about education, right? Um, folks have to really understand and line this up. The, the idea of white superiority, it, it starts at an early age, but it's not even in a malicious way, right? When you think about it, when I was growing up in the 80s, I looked at all what was geared to me as being the superheroes. And I watched my Mel Gibsons, I watched my Sylvester Stallones, I watched my Arnold Schwarzenegger. I, I mean, all, I mean, Harrison Ford, I can go on to the list, the list, the list of these superheroes, these saviors, even in a religion context, most of what I learned and grew up with, now that we've speeded up to folks kind of wanting to hear more of the truth was that there was this white savior with blue eyes and, and, and the hair looking like the white counterpart that saved me from damnation. And it's not only being told in churches, but it's also being told in history books as when Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. So this whole time that this, this idea that white people are superior and that a white person would save me from whatever I feel that is my plight, it starts at an early age. So when a young person goes into school and preschool and they're told that your hero should be white, um, the savior religiously that created all is white. What will you look at as black? And then here comes the negative connotation of black. Black guys wear black. Bad luck, you walk by a black cat, it's black. <laughs> you know what I mean? You see an idea of when we wear white, it's righteous. You wear black, it's like, ooh, you set the mood, you're dangerous. And this is all at an early age and it's not social engineering that's ne honestly supposed to be negative, but it really is when, when you break down how it defines you after a while. I'm searching and I'm chasing for someone to save me when really in our reality, black people need to save ourselves because the truth is we are the creators of civilization. So how in the heck would I be looking at someone else to come save us when we created y'all? And I think that it starts stinging people when we start telling that truth. You know what the oldest continent in the world is, it's Africa. So how the hell could I be running behind a Caucasian or European when my ancestors civilized y'all? And the reverse is told to us at a young age, so it socially engineers us to already feel inferior, when in reality, we are superior. Check out our DNA. Our melanin will tell you that all by itself. So. I think when we really go into those uh, um, kind of frames and we really try to break down and tear back the lens of racism in American white still consistently exists, it's the idea of how do we um, now dissect the social engineering that was done because the lack there of education, the lack there of truth at a younger age. When you look at all points, rock and roll, if I didn't know my history, I would have thought Rat or Poison or Bon Jovi created it. But it was the black people that created it because MTV is showing me a whole bunch of rock and rollers. And I'm just confined to believe like, well, shoot, Bon Jovi create, created rock. The realities that we face every day as black people is that 
not only are we isolated, but we are erased from history and we are erased from good history. And I think that when you continue to see black people in these unfor unfortunate predicaments, and I'll even look at it in the Black Panther movie that just recently came out, even in a Black Panther movie that showed all black people being heroes, all black people winning, you know what was defined? There was a white savior that saved us ultimately from damnation at the end. And that's kind of where we are. White people have to take away this idea of savior, take this idea of by serving or doing good, like I've been talking to some of the people in the chat, this is just the right thing to do. This ain't got nothing to do with charity. We are behind the eight ball because we're behind the eight ball because it was done on purpose. This is, wasn't a mistake that we made. It was a mistake that your ancestors made. Your privilege is a privilege that was sold in America long before you even knew what privilege was. So don't be mad at the effects of it. And you cannot be upset when we call it out. And when you sit there and say to us as black people that that was old and it happened a long time ago, it doesn't matter now. I then know you are not prepared for the truth. I then know you are not truly my ally. I then know you want to be comfortable the way America is. Because in California, affirmative action was not passed. Let's, let's, let, me, let me say that one more time. In California, affirmative action was not passed. That falls into our white counterparts, looking at their group, looking at what they're willing to give up to equal the playing field. And I'm going to stop at that point. I, there'll be workshops. I think Beth will be coming on and be sharing uh, information with you about the workshops coming up, uh, which will go from 11 to 12. Uh, and you'll find that there'll be one you can look on your uh, login. Uh, thank you, Alina. Thank you, Bishlam. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Amber. All College of Marin students, uh, they're all from College of Marin. Uh, they got this knowledge from uh, their experiences at College of Marin. And I do hope, as I conclude here, thank you so much from the Emoji Equity Institute. Uh, we have some things in place, as I announced in the intro. I think will make a difference. And I do hope and pray uh, that we'll be able to live up to your expectations and your demands about what we do here on our campus. But thank you so much, we're honored. Uh, let, me jump, let, let me jump in here real quickly. And this is what I dislike about this format the most is that you can't hear the appreciation that I know and the applause, the thunderous <laughs> applause that's out there. So please know that we all very much appreciate you. I want to say specifically to Barry, Amber, Paul, Bishlam, and Alina as myself, that thank you for sharing your experiences and your truths. I, you know, the words I wrote down, rich, enlightening, thought-provoking. I ought to tell you that what I most appreciate is uh, thank you for calling us out and for calling us to action. So I really greatly appreciate that. And Walter, thank you. Big thanks to you for your excellence uh, teeing up of the, of the presentation, your facilitation. And of course, your overall leadership in this important work. So with that, now I want to introduce uh, Beth Patel, uh, who is our uh, the chair of our professional learning